At Federal, we have products for every season and every pursuit. Our passionate and dedicated teams design, build, and deliver the world's best American-made ammunition, whether you're hunting, target shooting, or defending yourself and family. Our pride and hard work can be found in every box, ammo can, or bottle of ammunition. For us, it's always in season. It's federal season. Welcome to Federal Ammunition's podcast, It's Federal Season. I'm Jason Nash, Federal's VP of Marketing, and today we touch on an international topic that affects hunters worldwide, poaching. Joining us today is Nathan Edmondson, president and co-founder of Eco Defense, an organization that is working with wildlife defenders to stop the illegal acts before they occur. Nathan, thanks for joining us today uh, to talk about this really important subject. Thanks for having me, Jason. So we did a little bit of research. Uh, Brian, who puts the show together, and, and myself were uh, on a trip and, and looking at some different stats. About 50% of the world's poaching occurs in Africa, uh, particularly in Central and South Africa. And in 2019, uh, poachers killed around 600 white rhinos in Kruger National Park. And today, about every 12 hours, unfortunately, a white rhino is killed uh, and poached. So uh, estimates from several sources report that between 10 and 15,000 elephants, too, are killed illegally each year. Um, crime networks use the funds from the ivory to support wars and acts of terrorism. Uh, just really a important topic that, that you guys are addressing. Um, can you tell our audience, Nathan, a little bit about your organization and its mission to, to try to stop some of this? Certainly. Uh, Eco Defense Group is a... Um, intentionally nimble, small, and uh, uh, surgical group. We act in uh, below the radar. Um, we like to say we stand behind those who stand between the poacher and the rhino. Um, we're founded as a consultancy and a brokerage of capabilities. So we have in-depth uh, consultation in the front lines of uh, uh, various aspects of the, the poaching crisis, uh, the poaching war. And in those areas, we develop, um, we develop solutions and introduce either mentorship training uh, or other avenues towards capabilities to uh, create an asymmetrical advantage so that the wildlife protectors um, can go from the back foot to the front foot and so that we can move the, the crisis from uh, right of bang to left of bang um, in the parlance that you're probably familiar with. So uh, we, we aren't restricted to one area. You did mention Kruger. Kruger is um, really just off to my side here. And it is a, uh, uh, our, our home base, if you will. It's really where, where we were founded and where we've um, been in our deepest roots. But we are active in a number of other countries around the continent. Uh, um, and we go, we have an ongoing relationship in a couple of places. But generally, as a consultancy, we are invited to a place to solve a specific problem, um, and we don't install ourselves. We look to, to set up that capability to enhance the, um, uh, you know, enhance the, the program and enhance the ranger's uh, ability wherever we are. And then we, if it's the right thing to do, we, we move on from there. So um, uh, broadly speaking, where we fit in is that the crisis that you described right there is the demand drives uh, militant combat. Uh, the demand drives a threat to wildlife that unfortunately requires an armed defense. Um, we introduce to that defense layers of capability that um, with a goal toward deterrence, uh, disruption, and ultimately the safety and well-being of the rhino and the uh, or the wildlife and the ranger. Um, we say that we broker wildlife special ops, and to us that just means um, advanced capabilities from uh, veterans with unique and special backgrounds uh, in a quiet, clandestine, or covert fashion, uh, and that also involves um, the development of intelligence capabilities. So we look at the entire uh, ops cycle, intel ops fusion, ultimately to make sure that wildlife and ranger are safe. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate that. Um, tell us a little bit about who makes up your team and you know, what kind of skill set do you bring? Because I think, I think that's pretty unique to, to your organization. 
Yeah, so we we have an internal team uh, that represents um, different acts, aspects of the Special Missions Unit community. Uh, we're, we're an international board. We're an international board of advisors, international staff. But the primary base of our expertise that comes over to do the development of the programs are from U.S. Special Missions Units. Um, those individuals, we're not a personality-based organization, and those individuals uh, – are not uh, public facing. So a lot of them still have clearances or they come over with knowledge um, that requires a, develop, a level of protection. But we go based on the need of the problem, we will seek expertise. So you know, we go everything from small team tactics to working under, you know, under cover of darkness. We find the people who have really relevant uh, expertise and that have the right personality and sort of devotion to this problem set um, all the way to a uh, request that came in a couple days ago for assistance in uh, forensics work. Um, or uh, recently we had a request to develop crowd control uh, capabilities, for example. So we as a consultancy look at that and say, okay, we understand what the final problem is here. The final problem is there's a conflict happening you know, at a, uh, in a certain space and time and manner. Um, is the problem that you need crowd control or is the problem that we need to work backwards from you know that conflict to deconflict at, at an earlier uh, at an early stage in that problem. So again, we're not a strictly a training organization where we deploy you know training block A, B, or C. We come in as a consultancy and try to help develop a solution towards that problem. And sometimes it's as simple as they need flashlights. Uh, you'd be surprised by how how much uh, of the problem that people face over here hasn't even begun to be addressed. And so sometimes the application of low light, basic low light technology can make a dram- give a dramatic advantage uh, that's never been introduced before. But then we have to answer the, or ask the question, all right, we've introduced an action. Now there's going to be a reaction and we need, need to anticipate the, the counteraction. Um, so when we look for the expertise, we look for holistically minded individuals who aren't just coming over here to, to um, provide a skill that we're selling, but rather to... Uh, to, to reconcile what we have to bring with the reality of the problem. I know that's a little bit vague, but part of it is we're a specific with talking about the specific capabilities that we introduce and the people that come over. Sure. No, that makes sense. And it, you know, you talked about training, Nathan, and you know, that seems to be a big theme for you guys, you know, kind of a train the trainers and mentoring process. How do you connect with the, the local entities on the ground in Africa. You know, I've, I've been over there. I've, I've had the good fortune of, of hunting a couple of times in Namibia and, and Zimbabwe. And I've, I've seen firsthand, um, unfortunately, a, a poached elephant and, and the, bat, the struggle that they face um, over there with, with this problem. And, and I know there's, there's a whole different network of people locally. How do you make those connections and make sure that you're, you know, influencing them in, in the right way? Yeah, um, our access on the ground and our relationships at the parks is really the most important aspect of our identity. Um, in some cases, it has taken us up to five years to uh, just get in the room in the conversation where we know we need to be to really have, have an impact. Um, and so, you know, the answer to your question is carefully and diplomatically, I think. Uh, we work with African parks. We work with South African national parks. We rarely work in private reserves and uh, uh, private areas, partly because, you know, our, our permissions and our access uh, need to be maintained at a very official level, um, both from the U.S. official side, the, the host government official side. So we have to be cautious. The um, you know the, the areas that we're, we allow ourselves to work. Uh, we right now are focused on several areas that are the primary, um, that are the front lines of, of the rhino crisis. So you mentioned Kruger. There are a few other areas uh, that I can mention, one being Machete Park in Malawi, where we've had a, a strong, you know, strong program history. Um, the, the unique, one of the unique things about Machete Park, for example, is that they are looking for capabilities before the um, the full impact of the conflict hits them, they've introduced rhino to their 
park there and it's the sister park, Lawandi. And in those cases, uh, they have seen firsthand what happens when those areas, you know, when, when that species becomes targeted. So once you've introduced it, you're, you're essentially counting down until um, you're hit with a militant, um, you know, a, a militant syndicate back crime. Um, so we're not solely focused on the rhino conflict, but that is the umbrella species. And any of the, I think any of the syndicate back crime in areas which we are involved, um, they are, those same syndicates are going to be prime, you know, their primary, the bulk of their finances are in rhino. So you, one way or another, you're touching on the core of that problem. Um, but yeah, we, we have two areas of development of the parks. One is we're invited in. You know, we're asked, can you come solve a specific problem? Word of mouth and reputation is usually what drives that. We don't really advertise ourselves. We're, you know, we have more requests for work than we have finances and uh, uh, time to deliver on those things at the moment. Um, and the other is just organically through areas. We'll be working sort of on one side of a park and recognize that we're able to solve, you know, another aspect. And we'll carefully consider that internally. Do we take on this task? Because we want to be sure that we can see through each task in front of us to a, to an end state. So anyway, I'm giving rather saturated answers to your simple questions, but uh, hopefully that gives some context. Now that, that's what we're here to do. Tell people more about your organization and, and the good work you're doing. So what, what would you say, you know, what the local conservation officers, what are the biggest barriers that they face when it comes to protecting the, the resource? So that's, you know, right, right behind you there, which is pretty cool to have you remote. Appreciate you calling in from there. That's awesome. I'm really, um, as long as the signal maintains, um, <laughs> you know, that's a tricky one. I mean, you know, you can talk globally about the lack of resources, lack of land allocated to animals and relative to that, the, you know, the, the limited human resources and the limited supplies, but I'll highlight one example to like directly relevant to, um, federal, for example, um, lack of ammo. Okay. So. All right, you look at the, I'm going to walk, walk you through this. Uh, the rhino, for example, is a species that has evolved to have really no natural predators, except in rare circumstances. It's slow, it's dumb, it has poor hearing, eyesight, smell, it's gentle. Um, so, you know, the rhino has evolved in perfect consonance with its environment up until the point when we invented the bullet, right? Um, the rhino has no advantage over a four, five, eight round or even a seven, six, two round. Um, it uh, can't anticipate it, doesn't recognize it, and it's you know, immediately killed by it. Well, those, those same poachers often, the value of the horn is such that they're willing to kill for it. So they're willing to shoot at a ranger for it. Uh, they have nothing to lose, um, you know, generally speaking, whereas the ranger, the wildlife protector, or those officers, um, they need to be, they have, an, first of all, they have a lot to lose. Uh, second, they have rules that they have to play by. Um, they need to be proficient. They need to be quick. Uh, they need to be accurate. They need um, to, in all ways, have every advantage possible in a place where they, unfortunately, uh, because of the size of the environment and because of the nature of, of the movements of wildlife and of poachers are reactive means that within the space in which they have the opportunity to protect wildlife and to stop you know stop the, the, the wildlife crime they have to be very quick um, that requires training uh, there are a number of places where we work right now where ammo is um, they either don't have a budget for it uh, well that's the primary driving thing they just there's no budget for ammo training is limited to an extremely small number of rounds relative to what I think anybody in the U.S. would take to the range. Uh, we've done training iterations where at most you can get, and I'm talking multi-day through 60, 75 rounds per person. Um, the poacher may not have more rounds, but they have a number of other advantages. Uh, you can't expect the greatest protectors of wildlife who are engaged in armed conflict, what is in some ways a guerrilla, guerrilla war, to be as capable as possible when they have a resource limitation like that. Um, that's a global concern. So, okay, you've introduced to a group of, you know, 100 rangers, another 75 rounds per ranger, right? There's a whole lot of citizens in the U.S. who have multiple times that in their garage. But to think that doubles the amount of readiness 
from a marksmanship perspective that these rangers have. So I, I use that as a maybe particularly relevant example. Fortunately, it takes it takes a bullet to protect a rhino against a bullet. Right? You have to be prepared for that arm response. That is the reality of this conflict. It's the reality uh, of what's required to defend the rhino. The rhino has no ability to defend itself uh, against, uh, against, especially against internationally backed syndicate crime. Um, the rhino has no understanding of it. It is completely defenseless. Um, it doesn't know that it needs to pick up and cross, you know, immigrate to another country or exile itself or you know, flee the park. And it can't if it wanted to. So we have to defend it as, with, as robust and um, capable a defense as, uh, as it deserves. And so one of the limiting factors to that defensive capability is, you know, limitation of available ammunition. So um, we've also worked with ammunition that is 45 years old and uh, open boxes that have, <laughs> that are Chinese or Russian or Soviet in that matter. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing the certain limitations. Batteries are another one. You wouldn't think of it, but okay, you have torches now, which you haven't ever had 20 years of protecting, you know, something that the world proclaims and every celebrity proclaims warrants protection, but you've never even been given a flashlight. But now you don't have access to batteries. So that's where our sort of intuitive, consultative approach is really important to us because we don't want to give something and then show back up six months later, a year later, and find that it's sitting on a shelf or it's sitting on a rifle and isn't functional um, because we didn't anticipate every evolution of, of the application of that advantage. And we don't want to push forward into a capability that isn't reasonable, that really isn't going to be sustainable. So um, anyway, you know, I, I think hopefully that, that illustrates, you know, what, what is, that example is applicable in, you know, dozens of other cases, but it should be a, a basic highlight. Um, yeah. Okay, great. How about, you know, we, we read about this recent initiative you've got called, you know, it's the SEAM team in Table Mountain National Park in South Africa. Any additional detail you could give us on that initiative and how that's been working? Yeah, so we were asked to to join and help with this SEAM project at, a, at an early stage. It's, you know, one of the one of the ways in which it represents a really positive evolution in, in um, wildlife protection is in many places around the continent, uh, historically speaking, the ranger force is um, has been grandfathered in to a paramilitary role or, or whatever you want to call it. But essentially, they're people who signed up in, in, for, for a conservation job and were trained in a conservation job. So management of natural resources. They weren't anticipating... Uh, you know, armed combatants with AKs and having to move in small team leapfrog formations or, you know, whatever is now required of them in their job. Um, the same team on Table Mountain where they face a really aggressive abalone poaching syndicate crime. Um, and I mean, I mean, aggressive and, and uh, nonstop. Um, the same team represents an evolution in thinking, which is we're going to recruit specifically for this capability, recognize that this isn't something that happens at a park level, but is a small deployable, uh, small deployable team that's, that's capable in multiple environments, um, well-resourced, uh, directable, and efficient. And so we have a list of capabilities needed that we were presented with. So here's, you know, the, the, this team needs to be capable in a number of different disciplines. They need to be rap have you know, rapid deployment, Ability, they need to um, uh, have a lot of what to us are, I think you say, traditional special operations capabilities, you know, mission planning within the team, um, efficient communication, and a, a, a rapid deployment capability. So, this, without speaking too far beyond what I think I'm permitted to talk about, um, there is an opportunity for this model to inform a number of other places that are evolving to sort of get ahead of the crisis. And the men and women on this team, and it is equally, uh, it's equally populated men and women, which is like, actually this entire SEAM program is, has some awesome female leadership and participants. Which I think is something that should be highlighted. Um, and it's something we encounter often, especially in South Africa. Um, 
this team is, uh, they're awesome. They're well recruited. They're devoted. They are ambitious. They're energetic. They're an awesome team to work with. And a lot of times you find people are very well-meaning and willing to do the job, but they weren't selected for that job. So there is a difference in the, 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 the model, and the approach. And I think it's one that represents something that's going to start happening more in the future. That's great. Well, it sounds like you've got a really good established program there. And especially when you started out, what kind of reception did you get from the, the local entities, the rangers there? I mean, were they open to your help? Did it take a while to kind of, for them to warm up to you guys and understand what you'd be able to bring in terms of capability and, and assistance? Um, our growth has been very organic and we, we were founded right around a, a core program in which we, we were um, kind of handed a, a relationship of trust uh, without you know, belaboring you know, the, the, our history. Um, from there, we, we've really had a mentality of an organic approach. Uh, I think our, you know, whether it's, it's diplomacy or whether it's just proving ourselves and you know, bringing the right and mature partners and sponsors to the table like yourselves, like some of the donors that we have, the contractors that work with us, um, we're very careful. We don't openly advertise for positions. We, we only take, you know, handoffs from people we know and trust. We have advisors who recruit the right people for us. We try to be quiet professionals. We try not to make it about ourselves. Uh, very respectful of the fact, one, that we're always guests in the park, and two, that at the end of the day, we're not the ones risking our life. And these are operational environments with very busy people who do an important job. What I always try to communicate is that while it may be, you know, you, the Rangers, fight, it's also my concern. As my kids are here with me right now. They have the opportunity to experience one of the most extraordinary things I've experienced. And I can tell you this week, the last three weeks, I haven't seen a single rhino. Whereas five years ago, I would have seen one every third day, like on average. So there, there's a real, there's a reality to um, the fact that this directly impacts my life and the life of anybody who, who uh, cares about this. And well, whether they care about it or not, it's going to affect them. It's, it's a global concern. My point is, when we recognize and reflect that and have the um, and have the respect for the people and, and let them know how important that is. I think that that's a really important thing that we make sure that anybody who works on our behalf or comes over here comes with that attitude uh, and maintaining that attitude and maintain and, and not just purely in a diplomatic way, in an honest way, honestly reflecting the fact that this is, you know, one of the most important, you, this person does one of the most important jobs that I'll encounter this month and gets very little recognition for it. So, we start from a position of great humility is my point. And um, we've, while there's always attitudes uh, to be found of why do you think this is your issue? Why do we need you here? I don't think that's, that happens very often with us. Um, I will say there are times when previous, perhaps well-meaning uh, people, perhaps not, have come over and spoiled um, relationships for U.S you know, back groups and other international groups, either by coming to take their pictures and leave or because they've come over projecting sort of their, you know, not being humble and projecting their way to do it and engaging in dangerous activity or uh, something. There, there are people who've burned bridges before and we try to be very cognizant of that, very respectful and very careful and slow in our development. So a long answer to your, your question, but um, yeah, I, I think we, we earn their trust and we, are very humble and grateful for the opportunity to support these guys and these women. You know, I think you kind of touched on it, Nathan, but you know, most of our listeners are likely, you know, starting to think about getting their guns out to sight in for the deer season. So, you know, it's kind of a lot of them, you know, have not been to Africa, but you know, I, the rhino and the elephant and all the, the animals there in Africa are just truly an incredible resource that, that really need help. Obviously, you know, you mentioned, you know, seeing fewer rhinos today, so it's definitely an, an urgent issue. Um, how can listeners help? What can they do to, to join the cause? Yeah. Um, well, you can go to our website and you can donate. I mean, that's the number one thing. We are a privately funded organization that, that everything we do is based on donations. Everything does help. Uh, 
we unfortunately can't make broad appeals, advertise, uh, you know, with exaggeration. A lot of our work is, if we're effective, you don't hear about us at all. Um, so we, we do our best to convey with targeted media and things a lot of our work. But if we have opportunities to speak with someone like you and honestly the support of a group like Federal that gives us, you know, kind of bridges the gap of legitimacy, um, that is a huge opportunity for us. And so people who do have an interest in supporting um you know, a change in the tide for what is now a five to seven year timeline for the, the wild rhino. Uh, that's the ticking clock for us right now. Um, I encourage you to do two things. One, support us. And two, please take the opportunity to come over by yourself, your kids. Uh, come hunt if you like to hunt, but come over and actually experience the, the national parks, the big wild areas in the same way that you would, you know, you want to add Yellowstone to your bucket list, add Kruger, add uh, parks in Malawi, add the Maasai, add these places to your bucket list and take the time to really not just see the park from a vehicle and in the, you know, from a tourist perspective, but try to take some time to see what it takes to maintain these places and what the limitations of their resources are. Just takes a few simple questions to get a really, really pull back the curtain and get a, become very humble by how little, um, what little resources there are to ensure that any of this exists in the future. So we're grateful for your help, your support. We're happy to talk to anybody directly. We are a very small team with our own limited resources. And we are, as you can see, we're, we're mostly working. So we don't spend, uh, you know, we don't have a big machine back at home to keep fundraising. We're small, nimble teams. Our overhead's low. Our need is great. And we welcome anybody to support that. Great. Well, yeah, we definitely, any listeners out there interested have been, maybe been to Africa or, or want to someday, you know, hopefully get to go over there. It is an incredible place. And, you know, Federal, we, we, we want to have you on, Nathan. We really appreciate you being here um, because we're 100 years old this year, and, and as we've gone back and looked at our archives, um, a century of doing business, there, conservation has always been at the root of our interests. And, and you know, we need to continue to conserve not just for hunters, but for, you know, the ecosystem. So we, we really appreciate you coming on and the, the work that your team's doing there and, and the opportunity to learn a little bit more about, you know, what you can tell us uh, you guys are working on. So um, thank you for joining us from afar and, and, you know, best of luck as you can continue to battle this. And, and again, listeners, please do uh, check out Eco Defense uh, on their website and, and make sure you, you donate in every, any way you can. Thanks, Jason, and your whole team. We appreciate it. Thanks, Nathan. Appreciate you coming on. When we come back after the break, we'll continue the talk with Drew Goodlin. He's our Senior Director of New Product Development, and we're going to continue our Africa theme to discuss some of Federal's lineup of safari ammunition. It's a legacy 100 years in the making, where American ingenuity met a trailblazing spirit. Hard work united with patriotism. Technology blended with new ideas. Right here in Anoka, Minnesota. Born in 1922, made in America, proud to be the best. A century of innovation, and we're just getting warmed up. Welcome back to It's Federal Season, and our technology segment, Tech Talk. Welcome back to It's Federal Season Podcast. I'm Jason Nash, and joining us today on the Tech Talk segment is Senior Director of New Product Development at Federal Ammunition, Drew Goodland. Drew, thanks for coming on. Yeah, good morning, Jason. Thanks for having me on here. Absolutely. Well, Drew, we just finished a fascinating conversation with Nathan Edmondson of Eco Defense and the work that goes on to suppress the illegal killing of wild game in continents such as Africa. There are a lot of opportunities to hunt in various countries uh, of the dark continent, including both plains game and dangerous game, which is where they're mostly focused. Uh, before we talk about calibers and bullet options, let's talk about anatomy and shot placement. What, if any, are the differences in, say, like the antelope species of game in Africa, like Gemsbuck, Kudu, Springbuck, uh, compared to a whitetail? Is there any difference in where you'd place the shot? You know, as you think of that, Jason, you know, as hunters leave the U.S. and are used to hunting white-tailed deer, they really need to know the species they'll be hunting in Africa because they are quite different than the white-tail. 
So I think the first thing you do as a hunter is, again, you study that anatomy, you understand the animals that you're hunting, and then when you get to Africa, you really listen to your pH when you talk about shot placement and, you know, and the differences in the animals and what's required to, you know, effectively bring them down. It's very critical that you do that. And, and I suppose, you know, that obviously we talk about it a lot here, but caliber selection, cartridge selection, you know, what would you recommend on Plains game? Yeah, you know, you got to be shooting a rifle that you're comfortable with. So your big game rifles, your your big game calibers, the, the, the 30 cals, the 300 wind mags, you know, some guys will take rifles as small as six and a half, you know, whether it's the Creedmoor or the PRC, rifles like that. You need to be very proficient. You need to be able to shoot very accurately. And you need to use really robust bullets because in Africa, you might be shooting the, you know, hunting the small diker size animal, you know, the whole way up to Gems Buck and Kudu. So that that Plains game um, uh, lineup of animals is, is very diverse. And most hunters going to Africa are taking, you know, maybe two rifles, but probably one. And uh, so you're generally going to use a, a cartridge that's on the bigger size. You know, your Magnum cartridge, your, you know, say 30-06 up through 300 wind mag, even into the 338 caliber in uh, – so you you got to take enough cartridge and you got to take enough bullet with you when you go to Africa. Yeah, you talk about bullet, Drew. I mean, you you and your team spend a lot of time developing the next greatest uh, bullet. You know, I, I know that it's gotten pretty popular for longer range shooters to use a bullet that tends to come apart more, uh, not as much controlled expansion. Talk to us about that and you know why it's important to have one versus the other uh, in hunting situations. Yeah, Jason, I, I think you need to use the robust bullet like we spoke of, and, and we have bonded bullets. We have bullets that stay together, that, that deliver deep penetration into the animal, and, and maximum you know, terminal effects is, is what's critical. So, yes, in Africa, you're, you have the tendency to want to take a, a, um, a, a monolithic copper bullet or a bonded bullet like the terminal ascent product that we make or the trophy bonded style bullet. And because uh, you, you need, if you're shooting a large animal like a Gems buck that, that, that has a hide that, that releases very little blood, you, you need a bullet that's going to be able to, trans, to travel far enough into the vitals and then deliver that energy very effectively. So if you're using a thin jacketed bullet like you might on whitetail, you, you, you have a higher chance of not reaching the vitals and delivering that energy the way it needs to be delivered in these very tough African animals. And, you know, in terms of, you know, those higher weight retention bullets tend to be not always as accurate, you know, and if you're hunting in Pennsylvania, Minnesota, uh, in the woods and only shooting 50 yards, you don't have to worry about it as much. But Africa is a big open country like hunting out west uh, or in areas of Texas. What makes our products more accurate and, and what is there, does that factor in your range? Uh, what bullet you would choose? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the the first thing with hunting is you have to be able to get the bullet on target. So accuracy is very important. So yes, a lot of effort is spent uh, perfecting ballistics, accuracy on a bullet. And then once that bullet reaches its target, the bullet has to be designed to effectively deliver, you know, the terminal effects that you're after. And uh, so yes, there's there's modern approaches to making the more traditional hunting bullets more accurate. The uh, grooving the bullet like we do is, is one of those things you can do to make that bullet more compatible with more rifles. Because all guns are built different. The barrels are built different. So you're trying to get a bullet design that is going to be compatible with a, a, a wide variety of, of the gun systems that are out there today. So it's a big part of our design effort to, to meet all aspects of a, you know, the characteristics you're after in ammunition. Again, accuracy, terminal effects being able to shoot at larger distances. The optic systems that exist today allow us to do that. So hunters are shooting further. You know, what used to be, like you said, in PA, you're shooting 50 to 100 yards out west on into Africa. You're shooting two, 300 yards very effectively. And, and so the bullets have to be able to work at those extended ranges. Yeah, and I, I, you know, we've had a chance to use a lot of terminal ascent and, you know, we're biased, but to me, that's the best combination. There are plenty of bullets that'll work, but Terminal Ascent has proven at multiple ranges that it, it works really well. 
one of the one of the benefits of terminal ascent is is having a bullet that is soft enough to open up at extended ranges yet hang together high weight retention at the closer ranges so wherever you encounter that wood or beast or your kudu or gems buck you need the bullet to work effectively and, and yes so there it's been a, a lot of evolution in bullet design you know coming together culminating with the terminal ascent product line so then drew when you when you move up to dangerous game elephant you know cape buffalo uh the the, the base of that terminal ascent bullet is borrowed from another product that is those historically used on dangerous game tell us about caliber choice and and what bullets you use when you step up to a, a dangerous game like that people hunt in africa yeah terminal ascent's based upon the, the trophy bonded line of bullets with it's it's pretty tacky but it's the impact extruded style bullet jacket so it's it's solid copper in the back end of that bullet in the i in, in lead in the front end and the idea is that that bullet will upset at, at, at greater distances it's soft enough to upset Yet that solid copper shank arrests the upset, and you get this perfect upset virtually every time at any distance. And that's, that's the beauty of, of the um, terminal center, the trophy bonded line of bullets. Again, these are, these are soft bullets. These are bullets that upset. When you're hunting dangerous game like the Cape Buffalo or the Hippo or the Elephant, where you need to reach the vitals that are way in there on these really tough animals with mud cake skin, really thick hide, really big bones, that's when the solid bullet comes into play. And a solid bullet does not expand. The solid bullet is designed to stay on the shot line, to go straight, again, busting bone, reaching the brain, reaching the vitals at feet, you know, of distance. It's, it's not like a whitetail where you got six, eight inches to reach, reach the vitals. These big animals, you're talking feet to reach the vitals. So thus the solid bullet comes into play. And, and in Africa, often a pH will tell you that when you're hunting the Cape Buffalo, style animals, those dangerous animals, you're, you're going to try to take that heart lung kind of shot with a soft point bullet. And then backup bullet would be your second shot bullet would be a solid. So if you have a situation where you need to break a shoulder, you know, or a charging animal, you know, you got to come through the, the, the skull. That's where the solid comes into play. Yeah. And you, you want to make sure you put the bullet in the right place. And typically those shots are much closer but uh, so that's why the the accuracy of a of a bullet is not as much of a concern. But uh, the stakes are a little higher. <laughs> yeah, Jason, I was thinking, you know, in in our lineup of premium ammunition, our our, our Cape Shock line, our Safari ammunition, typically we're talking nine three size millimeter bullets, you know, on up through the five hundred Nitro Express. So it's in the big bullets that we offer those solids and that combination of a of a soft point and a solid and. Uh, Anyway, just a little background on, on where those bullets come into play and what, what cartridges. And what are, the, what are the most popular cartridges that people would use? You know, that's, that's a great question that we get asked at, at the various shows and whatnot, talking to hunters. 375 is a classic uh, big game, African big game cartridge. Good for Plains game, good for the Cape Buffalo, animals of that size. And, and then uh, as you get into the really big animals, the 458s, the 470 Nitro Express that we offer, rim cartridge typically designed for a double rifle, those, those, are, um, those are better solutions as the animal gets bigger. Big bullets awesome. for big animals, for sure. <laughs> That's right. Well, uh, Drew, thanks for talking through. Hopefully some of our listeners are actually going to get a chance to go to Africa this year and, and use some of our products on, on these big dangerous animals or planes games. So um, make sure you get the right bullet. Listeners, we appreciate you uh, listening to, to the technical aspects of, of bullet selection and cartridges. So, Drew, thanks for coming on. Yeah, Jason, Talk thanks for having time. me on. Thanks for having me on, Jason. It's a season with no beginning or end. With bonds so strong, not weather or age. Or thousands of miles keep us from it. Our love for it is as varied as those who are addicted to its pursuit. 
connection with the outdoors, with family, and your best friend. We plan with anticipation. We prepare and wait in silence. With tired legs, cold hands, we push on. All in hopes of hearing a call that shatters the calm. To see the approach of thundering skies and experience the instantaneous rush. For whatever your reason, this is our season. Welcome back to It's Federal Season and the News and Notes segment. Welcome back to the It's Federal Season podcast. Go on our website, federalpremium.com, and check out the merchandise page for the latest federal branded gear and apparel. We've got a great selection of t-shirts, baseball caps, sweatshirts, and more to choose from. Continue federal celebration of a century in business with special edition packaging that honors classic federal shot shell, rifle, and handgun products. Through commemorative and collectible packaging, there's a limited quantity being built, so make sure you act now. The loads offer all the same features and performance of their modern equivalents. We've got five options available at federalpremium.com slash anniversary ammunition. It includes three rifle options, 30-30, 45-70 government, and 30 out 6 and two handgun loads in 45 auto. It's really great looking packaging and is perfect for your collection. As we get into the fall hunting season, we've got great content and guest hosts coming on the It's Federal Season podcast. Check federalpremium.com for updates or tune into the Talk North podcast network where you can also find It's Federal Season. <laughs> 